Great. So we'll get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to our um, virtual open day <laughs> question and answer session um, uh, with the Department of Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering here at UCL. Uh, you can see we've got uh, most of our postgraduate team here today. We're going to be talking about the various programs that we've got on offer. And uh, we're here to answer any questions that you might have as you uh, go through our courses um, or consider applying for our courses next year. So let's uh, start the presentation. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, we're going to be looking at the master's programs today um, in the department, which are the MSc or the MRes programs. Um, yeah, my name is Billy Dennis. I'm the Postgraduate Programs Director. So I oversee all the postgraduate programs here in the department, the ones that are taught with uh, lectures and modules. I'm also the distance learning tutor um, for our distance learning MSc, although we've got a specific session on the distance learning next week where we talk about in much more detail about that. Um, so we'll probably get to that later. Um, with us as well, we've got Dr. Rob Moss, who's uh, our radiation physics tutor specializing on that route of the MSc. We've also got Dr. Henry Lancashire, who specializes in our biomedical engineering and medical imaging route of our MSc, as well as uh, Matt Clarkson, from uh, who runs the Medical Robotics and Artificial Intelligence program, uh, Dr. Andre Altman, who is our Artificial Intelligence and Medical Imaging tutor, and also we've got uh, Katerina Vega, who runs our master's research projects. And uh, that's a major part of our, all our MSc programs and MRes programs. So uh, it's a very important part. And she's going to talk to you a little bit about how those projects run uh, generally this year. So uh, here's a quick photos of the key staff. We've also got um, someone who's not here today, uh, Professor Marinko Saranich, who runs our um, MRes program normally, but he's uh, unavailable today. So I'm going to be talking about that later. Also, someone else you might come across later in the year, Professor Dean Barrett, who's our Director of Studies in the department, runs the teaching in medical physics and biomedical engineering. So our department, um, it's, it's one of the oldest departments in the UK and also one of the largest with a broad range of different subject areas that we teach. And um, the history of the programme goes back to um, the Middlesex Hospital uh, two centuries ago, um, where the X-ray device was, was one of the first being operated in the UK. Um, and in 1913, we had the first, uh, world's first hospital physicist professor, um, Sidney Russ, who uh, became the Joel Professor of Physics Applied to Medicine. Um, so you can see that in, in terms of history of our, our department, you know, there's, there's, there's some real heritage here um, going back a number of years. Um, as a subject area, we are what we would certainly call multidisciplinary. So we cover many different subject areas with uh, academics with many different specialties, broadly defined into engineering and physics and then computer science, but also medis medicine and biology as well. We sit as a department inside the engineering faculty, and this gives us good access to all these different groups uh, uh, to collaborate with, which is a key part of uh, all our programs, including uh, the master's programs that we're going to talk about today. So we're quite a large department relatively in terms of research staff with 50 permanent academic staff and uh, 80 researchers, as well as 170 PhD students. So there's good opportunities here if you're interested in careers and research. And as master students, you also get to benefit from the experience of all these uh, uh, cutting edge uh, researchers. And on top of that, we've got about 25 professional service staff and technicians to help support all of that team. So. We're a reasonably large department with a, a good opportunity for you as students to join and, and get involved. In terms of what the strengths of our department in particular are, is that we produce world leading and internationally excellent research. Um, it's well known, I guess, that UCL is, is quite high up in the university league tables right now. I think eighth or ninth in the world rankings totally. But particularly in our department, the last REF, the Research Excellent Framework, which is uh, the UK's assessment of university research quality, um, our department strong, uh, uh, graded very, very highly on these uh, with a large number of papers being world leading and excellent research. On top of that, 
as a master's cohort, it's a relatively smallish program compared to some other departments. So we usually have about 80 or 90 total master's students. And given the number of researchers that we talked about before, it means that we get to know our students quite well. We expect the students to integrate into our research groups and become members of the department in that way. And as well as us teaching you all the latest technologies and, uh, and uh, techniques that are used in engineering applied to medicine, we would expect you to contribute to that as well and join back. Um, another major strength of UCL's department for us is that because we are based in central London, um, we are in some cases right next door to some very large hospitals. Um, UCLH is the sort of sister hospital of UCL. And that's across the road from the main campus. Um, there's also many other large hospitals in London that we collaborate with. And this gives you excellent opportunity for um, you know, clinician visits and, uh, and to join research projects with real world output uh, in, in these big hospitals. So um, that's a major strength of the, of the department as well. In terms of our research, I, I talked briefly about some of this. Um, we've got many specialties in our department, but broadly they can be broken down into five rough subject areas. Um, the first being medical imaging, which probably forms a large portion, the largest portion of our department's research, and that goes into many different imaging modalities, including MRI and bio biomedical ultrasound. But also we've got one of the larger biomedical optics research groups using lasers and and visible light for various means, um, as well as uh, quantitative medical imaging, electrical impedance tomography, also some groups that look at electron microscopy and, uh, and advanced ophthalmic imaging. Um, so there's quite a large expertise there. Also in our department, probably one of the biggest things if you're interested in the radiation physics course is the radiation physics research groups in the department, which look particularly at X-ray imaging, and X-ray detectors and radiation detectors, as well as the proton and advanced radiotherapy research that gets done in our department for cancer treatments um, that's connected heavily with the UCLH hospital right next door. There's also groups that look at different X-ray methods like X-ray diffraction as well that you'd be invited to join. Um, a major part of the department is the computing strength of the department. We, um, as I've mentioned, are a cross subject uh, department really and one of the main links we have is with the computer science department here in engineering so we've got a lot of computing expertise as well used for various medical outputs including uh, computer assisted navigation and diagnosis but also computer assisted surgery and radiotherapy image computing as well um, we also have groups in more on the biomedical engin engineering side that look at implanted devices uh, for monitoring and diagnosing issues in the body, but also some interesting uh, treatments, for example, uh, electrical stimulation that's mentioned here, uh, neuromodulation and some various other optical and photoacoustic monitoring. And then something that has grown up a lot in the last 10 years or so is our robotics and AI group, of which the MSc in Ro Medical Robotics and AI is, is a key part of, um, looking at surgical robotics and advanced artificial intelligence as it applies to healthcare. Now, if you want to look up, and I would strongly recommend you do, uh, our different research groups to find out how you could uh, get involved with those in future years, then you can look on our department website uh, to look at this. So if I just quickly share my screen overall, I'll quickly go and show you what that looks like. So our department website, if you click on the research aspects, you can find all kinds of information here. Uh, you can look at spotlights on particular researchers to see what they've been up to and uh, what the latest research they've been involved with. But if you want to see what's available in our departments, then click on the research groups and you'll see that each of our major research groups have got their own set of web pages where you can go in and look at latest publications and what they've been up to. So let's have a look at the biomedical optics lab. You can see the different groups that are involved in here as well and some of the specialisms. So if you want to learn more about what the department does in its research, I would strongly recommend you have a look here on those research groups. You can also look on the department website at, uh, at the study options and postgraduate taught This Is Us. So strongly recommend having a good look at our, uh, our, uh, our website to learn more about the different subjects. Okay, so 
turning on next to, I guess, the purpose of today, which is to look at the taught postgraduate programs. Um, uh, generally, our taught programs will fit into a base of one of these three different categories. Either they have a basis in physics, they have a basis in engineering, or a basis in computing. Now, each of these subjects will, of course, require you to study a bit of all of these subjects. We, we cross many subject areas, and that's a good benefit of the degree. You get to learn about different subjects in the context of, of, uh, of other experiences. And so um, loosely, what we're going to be talking about today are these uh, five main degree programs, really, that fit within either the physics, engineering, or computing aspects. And you can see Computing aspects generally involve some kind of artificial intelligence applied to different problems. I, medical imaging is a specialty in medical robotics, but we've also got the main MSc perhaps of the pro of the department, which is the physics and engineering and medicine, which has two specialties, either radiation physics route or the biomedical engineering and medical imaging route. And then we've also got the distance learning routes as well. And then finally, um, the MRES, the department MRES, crosses really any of these options. It gives you full flexibility to choose which subjects you'd like to study really, and the, with the focus of getting you into research later in your career. So we're gonna start off with uh, the MSc Physics and Engineering and Medicine. Now there's, as I mentioned, two really two main routes to this program. Um, one of which is based in radiation physics and one of which is based in biomedical engineering and medical imaging. And so I'm gonna pass over now to our lead of the radiation physics group, group um, Dr. Rob Moss, who's going to talk a bit about the radiation physics uh, MSc program. Rob? Uh, thanks, Billy. Hello, everyone. Nice to uh, meet you. Um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the radiation physics route. Um, this route is really for people who are interested in medical physics uh, and uh, careers and and, and this may include people that are interested in working in hospital, but also the med tech sector and other related industries. Um, the program is designed to teach key skills, and I've tried to indicate that here on this slide. So the, um, the uh, ones that are highlighted in green are sort of key skills, and the ones that are highlighted in orange are related to uh, application. So they had a different um, module choices shown there. Um, we offer two streams. Uh, one is uh, an accredited degree. So this is accredited by the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine, uh, known as IPEM. IPEM is the, the uh, recognized professional body for medical physics. Um, and, in, and, and that stream is ideal for people um, with career ambitions to be a hospital physicist or a clinical scientist, for example. Um, the accredited degree is a fixed program. So um, the modules that are available are those in the, the, the first and the second boxes there, so the core and the research modules, um, and uh, there, there's no options. Um, but we do also offer a, an unaccredited route um, and this, this has some flexibility. Um, and that enables the person who's studying to pursue perhaps some other topics of interest in this area uh, or to learn additional skills that may be relevant to the career that they want to undertake. Um, if you could flip to the next slide, please, Billy. So uh, to try and give you a bit of an idea of what program is right for who, uh, I've got these uh, three students here. Um, so Sally uh, is interested in cancer radiotherapy uh, and she wants to work in a hospital. So the route that she's chosen is the IPEM accredited route. There's no options. It's a fixed, uh, what we call a fixed diet. There's no options, optional modules. Um, and at the you know, the outcome of that is that she would be in a really good position to apply for hospital clinical scientist positions, either via the, uh, the STP uh, training scheme or what's called Route 2, where you get a job as a, as a junior trainee uh, hospital physicist and, and, and work your way up to uh, full medical physics status in that way. Um, our second student is Aaron. Aaron's interested in uh, radiation protection. Uh, the route that 
uh, Aaron's chosen is the unaccredited route because it gives him the flexibility to go and do the module in uh, research software engineering. And he's done this because he knows that uh, any career in radiation protection is going to require a significant amount of Monte Carlo modeling. So, so he's decided that getting some familiarity uh, with uh, Python, for example, would, be, would really help his chances of getting a job. And uh, he then leaves our program and goes and applies for a job in uh, a manufacturer of radiation enclosures uh, who build rooms for hospitals, for example. And then our third student is, uh, is Kevin. Kevin's interested in uh, imaging technologies. Uh, he's chosen the unaccredited route um, because that gives him the opportunity to do the modeling programming for medical image analysis. Uh, that sets him up really well, makes him very attractive uh, for med tech companies. And, and in this case, he could go and work for an ultrasound development company. Um, whilst what we've spoken about here is very medical orientated, I did want to just take the opportunity to say that you'll learn some really transferable skills here that are applicable across a number of areas. So in terms of career, of course, healthcare providers would be interested in you. It doesn't, you know, if you start doing your degree and you think, actually, I really like academic research, then you're in a really good position to be able to apply for PhDs as well. Um, there's jobs at national laboratories, um, of course, medical manufacturing. If you want to make the big bucks, then you go and maybe work in the financial services. Um, but also like areas like uh, the nuclear industry, that may not be something that you thought about off, you know, straight away, but actually... Um, you're going to learn skills that will make you really attractive to those employers as well. So um, thanks, Billy. Uh, we can uh, move on. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Rob. Brilliant. So um, I'm then going to pass on to Henry, who's going to uh, discuss the biomedical engineering and medical imaging routes of uh, the MSc Physics and Engineering in Medicine. Henry. Thank you, Billy. Thanks, Rob. So the biomedical engineering and medical imaging route is for anyone who's interested in the applications of imaging or engineering to medicine. It's designed to be flexible. So it gives you quite a wide range of choice with some core modules that you're required to take. So those listed here, some of these cross over with the students on the radiation physics uh, stream. So you'll be in with the same group of students from radiation physics for some modules. And then for some additional modules, for example, medical electronics and control, you'll be learning special skills in that case in engineering and uh, signal processing targeted at medicine for engineers. The options on the uh, uh, biomedical engineering and medical imaging route are quite broad. You have a choice of a large number of options and you can choose two of these options in your degree. So you can tailor your degree to your interests, whether that's an interest in the applications of combining engineering and computing, designing image, combining imaging, computing, construction devices, or working in um, uh, orthopedics, computer-assisted surgery. Billy, slide please. So an example of some of the paths students have taken through the biomedical engineering and imaging route includes, for example, Leonora, who was interested in medical devices and engineering and took the options on materials for orthopedics and implanted human machine interfaces to move into uh, industrial biomedical engineering. Arno, who was interested in clinical engineering, possibility of working in healthcare, and chose uh, options from computer assisted surgery and orthopedics to move into an NHS clinical engineering training program. And Li Wei, interested in medical computing, who took specific programming foundations in computing and medicine and moved on to working with a medical software development company. Students from the biomedical engineering and imaging uh, have gone on to work in a wide range of fields, not only healthcare, for example, in healthcare providers within academia, but also going on to, for example, work in financial services, undertake a law conversion to work in uh, legal applications to medical devices, in manufacturing, and in software development. 
So to summarize, the biomedical engineering and medical imaging stream is very flexible. It gives you grounding in the different engineering and imaging skills you need, but then gives you flexibility to choose your own path. Uh, thank you, Billy. I'll hand back to you. Great. Thank you, Henry. Um, so I'll move on to talk about the distance learning MSc briefly. As I mentioned, there's a whole hour session we've got on it next Wednesday. So if you're interested in the distance learning program, then uh, I'd advise you join for that. We'll talk about it in much more detail. But just briefly, the purpose of the distance learning program is to replicate our radiation physics accredited program from campus. It's often taken by um, students who are currently working in hospitals as trainee uh, medical physicists and, uh, and need the MSc as part of their professional training to become a clinical scientist. But we also have a lot of people who perhaps need the benefit of the flexibility of an online taught program uh, or even a multi-year taught program. So we've got students across five continents. We have full-time students, part-time students, and you can take up to five years maximum if you'd like to complete the degree. There's a lot more variation here in terms of how you study. Generally, you study from the lecture videos that are given here on campus. Um, but on top of that, it comes with additional support resources, uh, including lots of time with the personal tutor, which is myself, but also extra exercises to really engage with your learning and make sure that you're studying in a way that's valuable and successful for you. Um, uh, it's certainly much more than just watch a lecture video or read a read a textbook. Uh, it's much more interactive than that. And that's how we found it's a much more effective way of, of studying by distance learning. So, um, yeah, in general, you'll study relatively alone. You've got the opportunity to do that. That's that's what the course is for. But you'll also have opportunity to actually interact with our students here on campus as part of the group project module called the Medical Device Enterprise, which we'll talk about later. But that becomes your route to absolutely work with on research projects with other students um, and additionally if you're UK based then you're more than welcome to come to campus as well for various points if you want to attend lectures some of our students perhaps work jobs but uh, live in London and so can't attend every day so they can attend a little bit some students might come for a bonus lab or to meet their supervisor there's a lot of options here the distance learning allows you that flexibility on the radiation physics route Okay, next I'll move on to our MSc in Artificial Intelligence and Medical Imaging, uh, which is run by Andre Altman. Andre, are you able to uh, yeah. tell us a bit about that? Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Billy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the MSc for AI and Medical Imaging is our newest MSc. And we started it because there has been a rapid demand and growth in a use of AI in healthcare. And I think there's no day passes without new news on how AI is going to change our, our, our lives. Um, as a consequence, there's definitely a growing employer demand. And we thought we built this uh, MSc with um, well, with the mindset that you want to equip everybody with the with the tools to start working right right away in a health related um, uh, field and imaging related field, but also as an ideal starting point uh, for further doctoral studies. And as such is that the topics that we teach uh, are closely tied to the AI research that we're conducting here at UCL, and particularly at the Center of Medical Image Computing, which is uh, part of the computer science uh, faculty and the uh, uh, medical physics faculty department, and also uh, the WISE Center for Surgical Interventions. Um, next slide. So yeah, here's a short uh, overview of the curriculum. And um, there are a couple of options there and a couple of core modules. Um, so you can see in the core modules, it's color coded, whether something uh, in, I guess that's teal, uh, in light blue or teal, um, these are computing and medical imaging and AI related topics. Uh, so more of a CS uh, content. And the orange uh, modules are uh, medical imaging related contents. And um, in the core modules, um, you can see that there's gonna be programming foundations, uh, machine learning, uh, uh, for medical imaging, information processing, medical imaging, and also biomedical ultrasound. And then we have this uh, box around the other two, uh, which are a couple of options that you can take already as part of your core learning. Um, you can decide, for instance, between your for an additional medical imaging module, whether to go for MRI, biomedical optics, 
or into imaging with ionizing, ionizing radiation. So you're asked to pick one of the two, or you can actually take both. And the other option you have to pick is between applied deep learning. Um, so that covers a broader range of deep learning models that are not really specific. Um, some of them are specific to imaging, but not to medical imaging. And then we have a newly crafted uh, module that is really specific to applied AI and medical imaging. So dealing with all the problems that you would typically encounter when trying to put those models to use in a clinic setting. Um, the research component is there's a research project, like with all other uh, MSc programs. And in the grayed out area, this is an option that you can have. Um, you can participate in the medical device enterprise scenario. So it's one of the options you can pick. Um, and in the rightmost column, you can see all the options uh, that we have available. So you can pick two out of those ones, um, one per term. And again, they're color coded. Um, so the blue ones uh, are blue and the green one are computer related, uh, computing related. <clears throat> and again, uh, the other imaging, medical imaging related ones um, are MRI and biomed biomedical optics and imaging and ionizing radiation. So you can, depending on the interest, you can dive more and learn more about uh, imaging modalities that you'll be working with, or you can learn about more computational approaches. So depending on where you wanna move in the end after your, uh, your studies end. And I think that's it, yeah. Great, thank you, Andre, brilliant. Um, so that moves us on neatly to our, our second artificial intelligence-based program, the Medical Robotics and Artificial Intelligence, which is run by Matt Clarkson. Matt, are you okay to say something about this program? Yeah, so my name is Matt. <clears throat> I'm pleased to be presenting this course. Uh, it's now running its third iteration, so we're accepting entries for the, for the fourth year of this course. Again, uh, likewise with Andre, uh, we're just uh, run, well. We're running this course sort of in response to you know a, a large increase in the demand for AI, but um, specifically, I guess, for this course uh, for in in medical robotics uh, and the use of AI and robotics in healthcare. There's been a variety of reports out recently saying you know this is a strategic priority for the NHS for healthcare systems globally, um, and We've founded this off the back of our world-leading research expertise in centres like uh, Weiss and CMIC that you've heard of. Basically, uh, it's closely tied in with UCL's research in this area. Uh, at the time, it was the first one in the UK. Um, I think that there are other courses coming out, so uh, I can at least claim we were the first. So that's good. Um, let's move on to the next slide. And hopefully by this point, you're starting to see uh, kind of a a common theme here. So uh, of the compulsory ones, everyone does a research project. Uh, I think that's one of the most fun parts of it. Uh, uh, and it's a, it's a major component. But then we have core modules. So for this MSc, there's two core modules in term one and two core modules in term two. So these are lifted, listed on the left. Uh, so we start off, uh, we'll be studying some core robotic systems engineering. And uh, we've got a fairly new module, basically AI uh, specific for kind of the data that you might get in surgical or computer vision in surgery. So this is, I guess, quite different from, uh, for example, AI for medical imaging, where you might be doing large you know, AI studies on population studies, for example. This is specific to, you know, real time data kind of data you get from surgical instruments, surgical devices, uh, in surgery, basically. Uh, in term two, then, we then take our core robotics knowledge and start to look at uh, then how robots are deployed clinically. So uh, medical robotics specifically, there's a certain amount of regulation and a certain amount of design processes that you have to go through. Uh, to make sure that something is safe to be used on humans. So we're not talking about, you know, robots in a factory building a car. We're talking about robots that are used to treat uh, uh, humans, and so they must be safe to do so. And obviously, with increasing amount of data, uh, surgical data science is becoming key to informing our decision-making processes. Um, after that, we've got a bunch of optional modules. And I guess the, the type of module that you pick could depend on your uh, past experience. 
So, for example, someone who's not done much programming might prefer to polish up on their programming skills with research software engineering with Python. Uh, someone who's done a lot of software could benefit from being a bit more clinically focused. So there's the option of doing clinical practice. Um, there's more robotics modules, uh, uh, also a sort of crossover technology, how these things could be applied to computer assisted surgery, more machine learning. And new for next year, uh, off the back of uh, well, one of our new lecturers is developing a new module uh, specifically in MRI guided devices. So basically uh, robots that you or me you know, mechanisms that you could design and build that would be MRI compatible. So uh, I think that's quite a wide range uh, showing you basically how robots and AI can be used in healthcare, specifically surgery. I think that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so finally, our final program, which we'll mention today, is the MRES in Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering. So this is slightly different as a master's degree to the other MSc programs. The aim really for this program is for students who would like to take up a career in research in the future. And it grounds you and gives you more opportunity to do a larger research project and then potentially you could follow up with a PhD afterwards. Uh, although again, that's funding dependent. So you, you need to uh, apply for those at the end of your master's as well. But the fundamental difference is that uh, the MRES forms two thirds of the total credit for the, for the, for the course, the actual MRES project, whilst an MSc project only, is only one third. So 120 credits versus 60 credits there. Um, in terms of module selections, really, the design of it is, is that you should pick modules that best suit what your research is going to be about, things that complement your research topics. So in that case, we can you can select modules that cover any of the other programs that we've already looked at. So perhaps if you're interested in artificial intelligence applications, you can pick the modules that relate to that. So if you're interested in cancer therapy, you can pick the, the radiation physics modules. And if you're interested in biomedical engineering, you can pick those or you can have a mix. Um, it's up to you really to pick that overall. And it, this gives you a nice flexibility. Um, one thing that is, again, slightly different about it at the end is that we would expect at the end of the MRES that you produced a piece of research which could be publishable. Um, and as part of that, uh, I think I'll pass on now to Katerina, who is our research project uh, organizer, who can talk about exactly how research projects work on our master's programs. So Katerina. Thank you, Billy. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Katerina and I'm the coordinator for the projects. Um, now, uh, you heard about all the different um, um, degrees that you can choose, but no matter if you go through a master's or MRES, you'll have to do a research project. And these research projects tend to form a really big part of the degrees that you're undertaking. Now, as part of the project, really what you'll be doing is to find the answer to a research question that has not been answered before. So really it's about doing a little bit of work with some novelty that fits into the scheme of um, projects and research that we have in the department. So within the research projects, you have the opportunity to work uh, with the, 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 the department, world, which is a world-class research environment. And uh, Billy has mentioned a bit about the different groups that we have and the different areas of research. So we have the opportunity to be embedded in these research groups. And as part of your project, you'll have two supervisors that will um, be guiding you through your research experience. And they will be uh, researchers that have a lot of experience in their fields, and they'll be well suited to, to guide you to success in your projects. Now, what's really interesting about the projects is really it's an opportunity for you to get a lot of expertise in a very small part of the wide research uh, landscape uh, in which your degrees will be part. So you'll become the true expert in that little bit of research that your thesis and your reports will be about. And when we think about the projects, a lot of it is about you developing skills like data analysis, experimental skills, programming, uh, all the, the hard um, skills that you need to, to get to your results, but also there's other skills that you'll be developing, such as communication. And as part of your, your projects, you'll be writing up a report, but also have the opportunity 
opportunity to present your research findings in the form of a poster and in the form of an oral presentation. So really it will give you a wide range of transferable skills. And finally, just as kind of a, a big piece of advice is really an opportunity to push yourself, right? Uh, the projects are one of those that as much as you give in is as much you get in return. And really it's a lot of pleasure to, to be able to advance uh, quite significantly in your research. So yeah, next please, Billy. Um, so just to give you a bit of a taste of the different types of projects that we have in the department, they will range from a range of experimental projects to computational or some data analysis as well. Uh, the first one uh, that we had there was about uh, electrical impedance tomography, where they developed an harness, an experimental project for low cost imaging. Um, the, the next one, um, can we do the next one, Bailey? Yeah. So this was more of a uh, computational project using machine learning to, to do outcome modeling in a type of cancer. Next, please. I uh, think this one didn't come through well, but this was a bit on um, an experimental project again on surgery for image uh, for non-invasive brain surgery. Next one. Uh, this is also an example of a computational project on looking at different algorithms to reconstruct uh, computer tomography uh, with multi-contrast. And uh, here is also an experimental project on developing tissue equivalent phantoms for a specific type of imaging. And then we have a last one as well, uh, which is an example of work that we've done in collaboration with clinical partners at looking at the dosimetry when we have clips in the body for protein beam therapy. So I hope this gives you an idea about the range of projects that we have. And that's it from me, Billy. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Katerina. Um, one other highlight, which I'll just mention here of, of our, our postgraduate programs is uh, this module, which is a, another research project module, but this time is a group project module. So the medical device enterprise scenario, as it's called, and um, you will work in teams. You're working in teams with on-campus students and, and distance learning students as well. The idea being that amongst all of us, we've got lots of different expertise from different backgrounds. You know, we've got physicists, we've got uh, mechanical engineers, we've got biomedical engineers, we might have medics, we might have computer scientists. And uh, it seemed like too much potential to put together um, to waste. So the idea is that you get together as a group and you need to invent a new medical device and then make a business plan to take that medical device to the market and sell it, ideally. So that's what the project's about. Um, at the start of the year, we give you a brief, uh, a, a problem for you to solve that you need to make the medical device uh, to fix. Um, so this is some previous examples of projects that have been done. So uh, robotics to help care home uh, workers, the idea being that that staffing in care homes is a real difficult problem and, and uh, staff time is is uh, hard to and expensive to pay for. So the students that year were asked to make robotic devices to help support that so patients so they could become more independent. Like the item here on the left here is a mechanical bed with different pistons that uh, can adjust the pressure at specific points on the bed. Uh, one of the problems this group found out in, in care homes was that patients who are immobile might get stuck in bed for days on end and they'll build up pressure sores, ulcers on their body, which can be very expensive and take uh, a long time, usually months to treat. So this is an automatic bed that adjusts the pressure to make sure they, it doesn't build up and they don't get those sores. Uh, this example in the center is a auto commode <laughs> as labeled by the group, uh, which is a, a wheelchair with a toilet in it that can automatically come to patients who are infirm when they need it. So it doesn't require the care home uh, person to, to come directly to the room with the chair or take them to, the, to their toilet. The toilet comes to them and it's got some uh, uh, imaging technology on it so that it could automatically follow markers along the floor, take it back to a cleaning station or to the patient's room where, where needed. So that was another interesting one. And then this example here on the right was an automatic braille reader. So it looks like a mouse. And the idea is you scan that mouse over the top of any book or anything that you want to read. And it will automatically read the text that's written there and translate it into a series of pins that raise up and down to make these little braille uh, readings that, that that allows the person who might be visually impaired to 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 read any text that's written down. So these are examples of previous years. It's usually a really fun project, an opportunity for you to work with different people with different backgrounds and uh, 
yeah, one of the highlights of our programs. It's compulsory module on the physics and engineering and medicine program, and it's an optional module on the AI program. So you've got a choice whether you want to join in that case. Um, so one of the, the strengths of our department and the programs that you'd benefit from is, is the strength of our collaborations that we've got uh, with both within UCL, but also external to UCL. Um, this can include research groups, so you can see at various universities uh, around the world and here in London, but also in particular the clinical groups that we find uh, that we work with. So hospitals across London, there's a list of these here that, that many of our researchers have, have links with but also some uh, pure research institutes such as the National Physics Laboratory, other universities around the world, but also industry as well. So we have a number of spin out companies that have come from research done in departments. Some of them are direct from our department and others are just work that, that many of our academics continue to do with outside groups. And all of these collaborations contribute to both the research projects, your individual ones, but also those group projects. So it's another key strength of the, of the department here. If you would like a little taste of the course, you can look up this small video, which will be on our department webpage, uh, an introduction to a magnetic resonance imaging with uh, Professor Karin Schmoyli, who is uh, our MRI lecturer in the department. Very interesting uh, lecture. I recommend you have a look at that. But if you also want to know on a, on a relatively easy level, some examples of different types of research being done, then I'd recommend uh, the department's podcast called Röntgen's Radio, named after Wilhelm Röntgen, who was the discoverer and, well, the first person to identify x-rays, um, where it's an interview where with an academic each each uh, each month where that goes into some of the details of research being done. And uh, some of our team uh, in the postgraduates uh, have been on this and, uh, and you can listen to them talk about their research. So look up Röntgen's Radio, available on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts and SoundCloud. So what's a typical study week like for you at UCL? Well, generally on the master's programs, you'll have around 12 to 16 hours of lectures per week. Um, then you're expected to spend around 10 to 15 hours of time studying on your, on your research projects, your individual projects. So you can see that what a large percentage of work we expect you to put into your research projects. You'll also have, depending on the module, some problem-based learning classes where you'll go through specific problems. Some of them are computing-based, might be computing labs we call where you can go through given specific problems and get help from our tutors uh, as you study and then you'd also be expected to spend at least an hour a week with either a personal tutor or an academic tutor as part of your research project or otherwise um, our tutorials and mentoring system well we've got tutor groups which form the, the same groups actually as the medical device enterprise scenario so hopefully you get to know your tutor group quite well, but your personal tutors are there to provide you with pastoral care. So if you're having problems throughout the year with perhaps health or if you're struggling with particular um, personal issues, then you can go and speak to them. But also they can help plan your future career with you as well because they've got experience in, in our subject area and they can talk about what you might need to do if you want to get a clinical position in the future or if you want to get into research. They'll be very helpful from that as well. And again, the idea is that we like to mix up our, our academic backgrounds so that you get lots of different experiences uh, over, over your studies with us. Assessments on our programs. Exams at UCL are all taken in term three, which is April and May, roughly. Currently in department, if you do have exams, there'll be a mix of in-person uh, invigilated in exam halls, the, the traditional way, but also some modules run online uh, timed exams as well. Um, each module generally has a small coursework, at least. Uh, it does vary with the modules. Most of the engineering and physics modules have a roughly 20% coursework task that you do in year before the exams. And But most computing modules, I would say, tend to be 100% coursework. Uh, you don't really have timed computing exercises and exams in that, in that same way. Um, we've spoken a bit about already the different things you can do when you graduate, so I won't spend too much time here other than just to highlight that the UCL Engineers Careers team are really helpful both for students when they're studying, you can go and talk to them and find out what you need to do to improve your CV, they can find you jobs, they can find you specific areas if you're still looking for some specialisms, but they also are useful for our graduates, so you get to keep using that engineers engineer Careers team up to two years after you've graduated. So 
uh, you know, we like to look after our graduates and make sure your careers uh, take off after you've studied with us. Um, briefly about entry requirements of the course, um, a 2-1 or equivalent in, in a UK bachelor's degree, usually in physics and engineering, computer science, mathematics or related, is generally what's required. Um, in some cases, with, with the web, very strong applicants for other purposes, we might invite you, if you've got a 2-2, to a short interview um, to see if you would be appropriate for the course. We generally consider in cases like this, for students who've got you know, maybe some experience in clinical work in their background, or they've got particular uh, expertise that, that boosts their application beyond their degree uh, results in their undergraduacy. So, um, Finance for the course, you can see here for next year, the course fees for UK and overseas students. Um, always worth recommending the various finance support you can get here, including postgraduate student loans from the UK government. Um, but also uh, UCL scholarships, um, which you can apply for. These scholarships, generally, you'll need to apply for quite early. I've put on some examples here of the deadlines. If you want to apply for next year's fees to have scholarships with, these are some of the deadlines for these particular programmes. The scholarships are usually specific to you as a student. There isn't a general department one uh, currently. Um, to join the program but if you've got a particular background as a student then you might find that some of these scholarships are ones you can apply for so have a look on the UCL scholarships website to to learn a bit more about that otherwise uh, UCL you know is a is based right in central London so it's a terrific city to live and study in you get access to the student life that that of, of a large university like ours you know large number of sports and cultural and arts clubs um, there's, we're about 10 minutes walk here in Bloomsbury from the West End with all the theatres and all the comedy clubs and various other things you can find experiences. The museums in central London, we're just north of the British Museum. Um, there's lots and lots to do here in London and lots of ways you can get involved, including uh, the voluntary services units, which we recommend that you join the UCL communities and, and get involved in some of these activities as much as you can. I think we'll leave the frequency asked questions perhaps to a bit to give you a chance to ask some questions as well. But uh, finally, if you'd like to stay in touch, I strongly recommend you signing up to some of our uh, social media links. We're pretty active and run by Naomi and her communications team on Twitter and various things here where you can see latest pieces of interesting research, small videos. There's podcast episodes even outside of Rankin's Radio. I know a lot of our teams have been doing more and more to share what they're doing with the wider world. So have a look there and you can use this QR code to, to look up some of that information as well. Um, and I think that's for the moment going to be the end of our slides. Now, we've got a little bit of time <laughs> here for some questions. Um, we've got with us, first of all, perhaps one of our former students, Athena. So I wonder if I could just introduce you and uh, perhaps uh, you could give us some perspective on the, on, on the, on the study, on studying here at UCL as a master's student. So hi, Athena. Yeah. Hi. Um, could you play, perhaps briefly just tell us when you studied with us and what you're up to right now? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, ca I can't remember what year it was that I started now. I think it was 2021 <laughs> um that I started I did uh Matt's uh MSE course in medical robotics and AI so I was one of the first cohorts to take it um so I did that absolutely loved it so I decided to stay at UCL um and then I joined one of the CDTs which is a center for doctoral training and I know we're not talking about PhDs here but um the first year of that um you I did an MRes in medical imaging so I've just finished that and now I've just started a PhD in I guess the broader topic is AI for medical imaging um so yeah that's kind of where I am right now and I've enjoyed it so much that I've been happy to stay for another three years now so <laughs> yeah. yeah could you tell us perhaps what your research project was on when you did your master's because that's always uh, when I did my MSc um kind of like what everyone said uh there's quite a lot of like there's a lot of range of research projects that are kind of out there so the module the MSc was medical robotics and AI I uh, did my uh research project in augmented reality um, so I was looking at how to get accurate depth perception um, using different ways of like designing it from colors and lighting. Um, 
And uh, I quite enjoyed that because that kind of brought in a bit more of a kind of not exactly just robotics and AI, but like looking at different aspects of medical technology as well. Um, so it is quite, it can be quite broad. And I kind of used that as a way to also like get like to clinicians as well. So I used, I created an experiment and went to surgeons to try and get them to, you know, test it out and get my data. Um, so yeah, that was quite exciting. And I published that as well, which was quite, quite good as well. So I went to a conference last year uh, in San Diego, which was fun. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, terrific. That's really good. Um, Lucy, how did you find studying in central London? Like what was the experience like of being in London here? I've actually, well, I've lived in London my whole life um, and I'm, it's, it's been quite a few years now, so I have loved it. I did my undergrad at, um, in London as well. And yeah, London's great. Um, it's got absolutely everything for anyone, no matter what your kind of interest is, if it's really random or weird or whatever it is, like there's always something for you to do in London. Um, and like Billy was saying, you, we are in the heart of it all. So we're so close to everything. Um, you know, even if you don't want to be in like complete central London, um, you know, you're just a short train away to like not exactly central London. If you just want to live in a bit of a quiet area, you know, we're really close to um, Regent's Park. So like a huge, you know, green space and everything. So I've loved it. Like there's really good food, really good culture, good activities to do, good places to, you know, go for a drink as well, if you want to be safe. There's, there's things for everything um so yeah I've absolutely loved it like no matter what your interest is um so yeah don't be don't think that London's just this like really crazy busy central London because it's actually just this huge city that kind of has a bit of everything for anyone but I've loved it and we'll stay here probably for the rest of my life so yeah I love it here great that's good to hear yeah um does anyone else on the panel have any questions that they'd like to ask uh Athena right now perhaps Okay, great. Well, I think we'll probably go on and look. Sorry, at Billy, I've I've got a, a really quick question. Oh, no, uh, Athena, uh, you're the president of the uh, MedTech Society uh, Student Society. I wonder if you wanted to give your uh, Student Society a little plug uh, for prospective students to join. Yeah, um, I guess similar to what Billy said as well earlier, like there are so many societies and clubs that go on UCL, like it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, I do remember when I first started, I kind of made this long list of all these societies I want to join and it, there's so many that there's she's something for everyone um but I guess my interest and in why I kind of did the MSc and why I've continued is I love anything around medical technology um and we do have a med tech society at UCL so I joined it in my very first year when I did my MSc um so I've been on the committee for two years now and because I knew I was staying finally for a, a whole year I uh became the president so I'm currently the president of MedTech Society um, and uh, I mean I love it because I get to explore like not just like my PhD project is more towards AI but it also gives me the opportunity to like explore all the different aspects of other technologies um, in medicine as well uh, you can do it in other ways as well but um, yeah I've organized like conferences speaker events um, I've also got like a whole team with me who you know helped me out with it um, but yeah I I love it like one of my friends has also made a new society she made like the biopharma society as well so if there is for some reason something that you're not happy like there is there isn't something for you for the societies you can make your own and go with it but it's a really good way to meet people outside of just your like academic group um, and make other friends and yeah there's really good volunteering there's really good like you know other any any kind of societies we do a lot of collaborations as well with other ones as well so yeah if you're interested in med tech society you're more than welcome to speak to me about it or any other things i'm sure i can help you out with that yeah, i wonder perhaps maybe you could uh drop the instagram uh link in the chat in case any of the attendees yeah. wanted to have a look at the instagram page yeah sure i'll do that now Great. Yeah. And we, we really encourage, you know, our master students in particular, because you've got a full year with us to get involved with the societies and department as well. There's opportunities and we, we want you to grab it with both hands. You know, generally uh, the students are very, you know, you're all very hardworking and very keen. And that's what we like to encourage. Um, I'll quickly go through some of the questions that people have asked uh, uh, as fast as we can here. So I've noticed um, there's one question here that says, if I want to work at the NHS as a medical physicist, 
uh, would I attend this course of study on my own or would the NHS provide me with it? Um, there's a couple of options here um, <laughs> commonly. So general, to become a hospital medical physicist, you require as a, a training to become registered as a clinical scientist. You need to have done a master's degree and completed a number of competences, competencies on the job in whatever the specialty that you're looking at. So that might be dosimetry, radiation therapy planning. Um, so some students will go on to the specific scheme that the NHS provide, which is called the STP scheme, scientific training program, um, where you can, they'll provide it for you and you can study a master's with them or you can do it beforehand. Those, there are a few places on that each year. And so having a master's is becoming more and more important to be able to apply for those. The deadline for this year has passed already now. It was uh, last week. Um, so it's a lot of our students on the master's do our master's and then go to that STP scheme. That's pretty common. But perhaps more and more common these days is what's called Route 2, which is what Rob mentioned, which is where the hospital hires you in a trainee position and they will give you the competences that you need. Now, sometimes they hire those people without masters already, and, and they might support you to do a master's part time, which is a lot of our distance learning students do. Or um, you might have students who, who, um, who uh, yeah, who've already got a master's. They they use their masters to get one of those positions, and we we you know we forward job applications opportunities to our students because they'll often come to us and ask, "Are oh, we looking for a graduate from your program? Have you got any right now?" And so that's another way around it. So it, will the NHS provide it? There's options in both directions, basically. But given the competitive nature of it, it's sometimes helpful to do a master's first. Um, prerequisites, I saw two questions on prerequisites. So we mentioned that 2-1 is the UK equivalent. If you go to our department website with the application process on the prospectus, you can click on international equivalences to find out what European equivalences of a 2-1 in our subjects areas are, or even the US, US star ones as well. I'd be confident if, if you said that you are majoring in computing and minoring in physics, you would be you would be considered uh, possible to transition into our radiation physics MSc. Yeah, we, that would be considered enough. So um, that's just something to say there. Um, by the way, what's the cohort size for the respective master's courses last year? So I guess this year we can talk about it. So. Um, uh, the physics and engineering and medicine, the both programs together is about 40. Uh, this year, it's roughly 10 on each of the AI programs. And um, the MRES, about another 10 is pretty typical. Distance learning, about 20. Um, next year, we've been asked, yeah, it's possible there might be some more places available as well. So roughly, as I said, it's about 70 or 80 in total with, with everyone else together. But that might move up a little bit um, this year. So it's a relatively small cohort and you can see all the academics here that lead them. You get a bit more personal attention that way, which is a positive. Um, anyone else on the panel? I haven't been following the chat, I'm afraid, because I had to keep the screen up, but are there any questions here that I've missed so far? Um, do any companies provide a graduate training scheme for medical robotics? Matt, are you able to answer anything on that right now? I'm about to type. Uh, okay. I think the short answer is not that I'm aware of. So most people with a master's uh, or, or via a PhD would end up going to a company, uh, typically as a staff scientist or a staff engineer. I guess these are quite specialised positions, really. Uh, so I'm not aware of companies that run big graduate training programmes. Yeah, it's a relatively new area as well, it's yeah. worth saying. So these might be developing and, you know, Similarly, if we hear opportunities in department about these things, we do forward them to our students. So uh, uh, that's always worth considering. Um, uh, professor, I'm not sure which course would be ideal for robotic surgery because I'm interested in robotic surgery, in clinical robotic surgery. Should I take medical robotics or medical physics? Um, yeah, th there are different streams to this. Matt might be able to say here as well, <laughs> but um, it sort of depends slightly on your background. If you're an engineer or physics type and you've not done much computing before, then you might be more suited on our medical physics or the, specifically probably the biomedical engineering route of the MSc and physics and engineering and medicine. But if you're more clinical, if you're more computer science, got some more experience in coding and you're interested in sort of these AI software 
uh, applications of this stuff, then then probably the medical robotics and AI program might be more suitable to you because that is uh, has a stronger computer focus. But Matt, do you have any additions yeah, to that? <laughs> I'd have said just quickly go back to the the web page, the prospectuses. I think just at a really high level, the medical physics is is studying more medical imaging. Uh, and you know the physics of how you create the images right yeah whereas uh the medical robotics and ai is you know covers some of our the, the core computing uh it's core robotics modules from the computer science department hmm. um and it's it's much more about yeah robotics and ai <laughs> so g given those two choices i'd have probably said the robotics and ai one hmm. right and then uh, I know we're overrunning here, but I'll just try and answer these last few questions. Uh, I have a BSc in medical imaging radiography, radiological sciences, and I'm looking to apply for an MSc AI in medical imaging. Does this qualify as other related courses? Um, it would potentially, but uh, Andre might be able to speak about the specifics here. So what are you looking for, Andre, uh, in the medical imaging and AI? Um, yeah, so typically we um, expect people to have a good math background because there's a lot of you know, math to go, go through when you work with machine learning um, and also programming experience or some sort of formal programming experience. I mean, also, if you don't have uh, a course, I mean, if you have a GitHub page where you showcase your projects, uh, that is definitely helpful. So it's, it's those things because um, getting through the program requires you to program quite a bit and, uh, you know, following all, all the math uh, bits. So, um, it sounds, you know, that this would be considered, yeah. Mm. Great. Thank you. Um, scrolling back, oh, uh, yeah, I think a lot of these questions have been answered already. That's great. Thanks for those that answered in the chat earlier. Okay, well, in that case, I think we'll bring the session to a, an end today. But if you've got further questions and you want to ask um us about it, then you can email our uh, department website and, or us individually, and you can find uh, we'll, we'll reply pretty quickly to a lot of these questions, and uh, you can get the, the feedback that you need to make your decisions on whether to apply for the programs or not. So, um, thank you all for attending, and thank you for the panel for answering the questions so well, and Athena, and um, I hope to see you all next year. Thanks, thank Naomi. You. Can you stop the recording? <laughs>